Welcome to the Pocket Paramedic Podcast, where we're here to help student paramedics transition from university lectures to ambulance placements. In this episode, we'll be discussing history taking and handover tips for maternity patients. So when I was a student, I was a second on scene at a job where a patient had given birth in a bath, I think it was, and the RV paramedic had already delivered the baby, and then he started handing over the job to me. He came out with a lot of information that I'd never heard of. In what seemed to be a really good set format and set order. And I did that thing that I've done so many times as a student and you might be able to relate. Where you're listening to a handover from a paramedic that you maybe don't know so well. And all your brain is doing is saying, remember to listen, remember to listen. Listen to what he's saying, take the information on board, remember to listen. And then by the end of his handover you realised you haven't actually took anything on board because you were so nervous about looking like you knew what you were doing. When it came to the finished handover, I couldn't remember any of the information at all. And that negatively reflected down the line when I had to hand over the patients and the midwives in hospital. When I got there, I didn't know what to say and my mentor started taking over and just reeled off this really well-structured handover uh, that included all the information that we received from the paramedic that was already on scene. And I'd never heard many of the information within this sort of handover that was related to maternity. It's, it wasn't something I'd come across at the time. And it's one of them examples of it, of one of the things that you pick up when you're out on the road. And they don't necessarily cover this specifically in university. So I wanted to cover it today in a podcast. So from that experience, um, for obvious reasons, I felt pretty shit after that job. I felt like I didn't know what I was doing. And to be fair, I didn't really, and which is absolutely fine and understandable because I'd not come across it before and it was the first time I'd had to deal with it. So I had a chat with my mentor after and we were able to put together this structure that I'd seemed to have heard from both the paramedics at this stage and put it in place so that when I got to the next maternity job, I was able to then reel off this history, this structure of what we need to gather from the patient, what's happened during the birth, for example, and what information is vital at that handover point. So to get an overall history of the pregnancy when birth's not imminent, I like to use Tenkaba, which is a mnemonic, and the letters are T-E-C-P. It doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, but it works quite well. Under T, think trimester. And that should prompt you to ask the question, how many weeks pregnant are you? Under E, think expected delivery date or last menstrual cycle. This can vary depending on how far on in the pregnancy they are. If they're quite early on, last menstrual cycle might be relevant. If it's towards the end, expected delivery date gives you a good idea of how far along they are. The C stands for complications. And this is where you can ask questions like the results of last scans, the last time the fetus was felt, the baby's positioning, is there any health concerns with the mother like eclampsia, preeclampsia or gestational diabetes? And P stands for previous. Now when I say previous, I'm referring to previous births and previous pregnancies. Midwives sometimes refer to this as gravida and parity, where gravida refers to previous pregnancies and parity refers to previous births. Previous should also prompt you to ask questions like, have you had any abnormal deliveries in the past? Any quick births? Things like histories of shoulder dystocia, miscarriages, ectopic pregnancies, any complications with previous births or pregnancies. If the birth's progressing, here's some things to look out for in your history and to reference on handover when it's got to the stage where you've had to deliver that baby. You want to find out what time contraction started, their duration and the length apart, what time the show occurred, and a show, if you're not sure, is a vaginal discharge like a mucousy plug that's expelled immediately prior to labour. So by noting the time occurred, it gives you a good idea of when labour started and its consistency can be relevant to the midwife. So when you explain if there's any abnormalities there, 
He then want to make a note of what time the waters broke and the consistency of the fluid. Discoloured consistency could indicate that meconium, which is the baby's first poop, could have occurred a little bit too early and it can be a sign of a distressed baby. So make sure you note the time the waters broke and the consistency of the fluid. So at this stage of the uh, progression of the pregnancy, what's going to start entering your mind is whether you can start making a move to hospital or whether you need to stay put and deliver this baby. So there's four things that I always look out for, which tells me that birth is imminent. And that is regular contractions that are one to two minutes apart, an urge to push, the baby crowning, and the baby's head visible at the vulva. If those features are present, then the chances are you're going to have to deliver this baby. Now would be a good time to open up the mat pack, set up a space for neonatal resource, and get your colleague to open up the maternity section of the JRCalc Plus app. As the birth progresses, you need to know the time of birth, any complications that were encountered, if there was any meconium present during or before the birth, the amount of blood loss from mum, delivery time of the placenta, and whether or not the placenta is intact or not. Now sometimes the placenta won't deliver on scene with you and you might be going to hospital transporting that patient with the placenta still within. But if it does deliver with you, you need to know the time and the how intact it is. Now, once it's delivered, make sure you take it with you, pop it in a bag or somewhere suitable and bring it with you up to the maternity ward so that the midwives can assess that placenta. We haven't gone into too much depth here regarding the newborn assessment because I want to keep the focus on history taking and handover in this situation. But I'll just quickly highlight the importance of including that initial assessment of the newborn baby by documenting and handing over information like how long it took the baby to pink up and cry, the initial heart rate, respirate and tone, and any interventions that you may have had to perform at the time of birth. So that's five rescue breaths on neonatal resuscitation. Next, I want to address how we can add on a pregnancy history to a non-pregnancy related presenting complaint. So for example, let's say you attend a 26 year old female who's complaining of feeling short of breath. You initially need to address that shortness of breath. And I recommend doing this by adopting the socate approach. So I've mentioned socate before, and it's just a adaption of Socrates for pain. And you can use it for non pain related presenting complaints as a history taking prompt. The S stands for symptoms, which in this case is shortness of breath. The O stands for onset. So you can find out when this symptom started and what they were doing when it came on. C stands for character, prompting you to be prompting them to be a little bit more descriptive about their symptoms. A is for associated symptoms. So you can find out if they have any other symptoms alongside the shortness of breath, like pain or dizziness. T is for time. So you can find out if these symptoms are constant or intermittent. And E stands for exacerbating and relieving factors to establish if anything makes this shortness of breath better or worse. Now we've got some information on the initial presenting complaint. We need to follow this up with pregnancy related questions. The Tenkapa TECP approach we've already mentioned can fit nicely on the back of our socate history. So if we remember T stands for trimester. So how many weeks pregnant are they? E stands for expected delivery date or last menstrual period. The C stands for complications. So we can include questions about last scans. Has the baby been kicking? Are there any pregnancy related complications with mum? And the P stands for previous. So we can find out how many times mum's been pregnant and how many times she's delivered in the past. Sometimes the presenting complaint history can link in with the pregnancy history. So for example, we might find out that one complication our patient has with the pregnancy is severe anemia and a symptom of severe anemia is shortness of breath. So the information we've collected so far fits nicely into the history of presenting complaint. 
And that's what we've sort of discussed, just that section of the history. Once you've finished this line of questioning, you can then move on to your biomedical model of history to gather past medical history information, medication information, family history and social history. So I hope this podcast has been helpful and you've got some sort of value out of it. All the information I've mentioned can be found in the History Taken and Diagnosis pocketbook on pages 26 to 28. So you can refer to these pages as a history taken reminder when you're on your way to a maternity job. If you haven't got a copy of the book, click the link in the show notes to have a look and see if you're interested in it. And there's also a link to my free ECG ebook there if you want to gain access to that. Speak soon, Liam.